So we've got a few people in the waiting room. Glad you could join us, glad you're here. Can you Has it been raining me? much in Fort Worth? No, not really. Yeah. We, had a little, we had a few showers last night. Mosquito, mosquito population's going up though. Oh yes. So we, and we, we had spraying last night. And I, I noticed, I saw on the, uh, in the Dallas Morning News, they isolated West Nile and some of the, some of the mosquitoes. That's just what we need on top of everything else. More virus. <laughs> yeah. If you're not going to get COVID, then you're going to get stung <laughs> by a mosquito. Yeah, exactly. Did you, uh, are, are your kids very sensitive to mosquito bugs? Yes, my youngest is. He, if he gets one, it's huge, it's itchy. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the magnet for the family. So yeah. everybody likes having me out because if I'm out, nobody else gets. <laughs> Somebody's got to be that one testing. Exactly, exactly. We use a lot of the Ben's wipes. Uh, which are ready. Have you ever used those? Yeah, yeah. Really good. I, and I like a white product so much better than the sprays. Definitely. Easy to use. And they're nice, you can get them online. Of course. Okay. Good. Well, I think uh, I'm going to go ahead and screen share now, April. And let me get, let me get us up and going. Okay. Good. Okay, well, I certainly, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I certainly wanted to welcome everybody to week 10 of our uh, Sages Durham Pat Happy Hour. I uh, wanted to welcome everybody to our new time. Uh, moving forward, the sessions will be at uh, 5 p.m. Central with 6 p.m. Eastern. And we're only gonna be doing them live on Mondays uh, and we'll be recording the sessions. They'll be up on our YouTube site so uh, you can watch them uh, at any time if you want. But uh, again, they'll be on Monday nights uh, at new time, 5 p.m. And that will be, uh, that will all be spelled out in your, uh, in the email that you get. Um, and again, uh, we wanted to reiterate the fact that we know this is a transitional time uh, for most people, third years uh, going out into the workforce. Uh, second years uh, moving up. And please uh, let us know if there's anything we can do to uh, to support you in this uh, transitional time. For those of you who are leaving, uh, if you uh, want to continue to use our resources, uh, make sure you forward your email address to, to uh, education at sagesdx.com. Uh, most, most of you, a lot of you will be used, losing that educational Email. So if you can provide us a personal or a Gmail address, we can make sure that we can be uh, on our list uh, for upcoming educational activities. Uh, and uh, again, um, a lot of the sessions we've been doing and content has been driven uh, from your suggestions. And so I would encourage you to, uh, to please continue to email us suggested topics. Uh, and we'll definitely incorporate those into future happy hours. <clears throat> as I'm speaking to you now, as you're watching this session, this is a, a pre-recorded session, a remote session. Um, I'm going to be on vacation next week. Uh, and throughout the year, most of the sessions will be live but from time to time uh, as either I'm out or as we ask a guest speaker to come in and do one of the happy hours that will be pre-recorded. So uh, please give us any feedback on the pre-recorded sessions as well. That being said, we definitely want you to uh, feel free to submit any questions that you have uh, regarding this particular session or any session to our education email, education at sagesdx.com. Uh, likewise, you can reach out to me directly. Uh, my email is tdavis at sagesdx.com. My cell phone is 210. 416 or 815, please feel free to text or call at any time as well. So that being said, we'll go ahead and get started on this week's session. Uh, the topic of this week's session is uh, kind of fungus and friends or fungus among us. And uh, this was a suggested uh, topic by uh, Dr. Garbell from Houston. So thank you, Daniel, for that, uh, for that suggestion. 
Okay, our first slide, slide one, is a uh, punch biopsy. I'm gonna go ahead and rotate the slide here. And uh, we have a punch biopsy from the trunk. And uh, as we move to higher power and uh, take a look at the sections, we see there's a, a very sparse superficial uh, perivascular infiltrate within the dermis. And moving to higher power, uh, we begin to see that the uh, cortified layer is slightly thickened, slightly thickened by basket weave hyperkeratosis. Uh, there's a very sparse superficial perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes within the dermis. And uh, as we move to higher power, within this thickened stratum corneum, one begins to see organisms. Uh, specifically, there are spores and kind of curved, short, stubby hyphal elements. Uh, notice that there's no appreciable inflammatory infiltrate either within the uh, epidermis or within the stratum corneum. Again, we have the sparse superficial perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes, but uh, a largely non-inflammatory process. And this, of course, is uh, tenia versicolor. Uh, tenia versicolor is easily identified in HD's vein sections. The, uh, the organisms have a characteristic morphology. They're blue, uh, and one sees spores and these kind of curvilinear or short stubby hyphae, so-called spaghetti and meatballs or, or uh, uh, meatballs and ziti, and uh, very characteristic appearance. And what we're gonna be focusing on uh, the first four or five slides is very superficial uh, fungal infections or superficial organisms that involve uh, the uh, upper portions of the epidermis of stratum corneum. And then we'll close out with some examples of uh, deeper fungal organisms. And generally, uh, one additional point to make from this slide is, you know, on scanning magnification, if you see just a very sparse inflammatory infiltrate, uh, as you move into higher power, that's when you want to kind of systematically start in the stratum corneum and work your way down looking for subtle alterations uh, that might give you a clue as to uh, the diagnosis uh, in a particular case. But tenia versicolor, easily identifiable organisms, basophilic color, and um, usually very, very posse inflammatory. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide two. In slide two, we have another punch biopsy, also from the trunk or proximal extremity. And uh, as we move into higher power, we can see again, there's a, a perivascular infiltrate within the dermis. This one's a little denser, a little more robust than we saw in slide one. Uh, in addition, the epidermis is slightly uh, acanthotic here. Uh, crisp interface, not much in the way of spongiosis, a, a little bit of uh, epidermal hyperplasia. And uh, as we move into higher power, we can see both basket weave orthokeratosis and compact orthokeratosis within the stratum corneum. There's a uh, perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes and a rare neutrophil present within the uh, papillary dermis. See that? Neutrophil right here, kind of hone in on it. And um, when we look at the stratum corneum, we can see that we have a two tone stratum corneum uh, in that we've got basket weave orthokeratosis. And let me see if I can get the slide to quit moving here. Basket weave orthokeratosis kind of up top and a little bit of. Uh, parakeratosis and compact orthokeratosis below. This is a so-called sandwich sign where you get a uh, two-tone stratum corneum. And usually it's basket weave orthokeratosis and either underlying compact orthokeratosis or parakeratosis. And that can be a useful clue to the diagnosis of a dermatophyte infection. And indeed, if you look at the transition zone in this case, between those two types of stratum corneum, we begin to see uh, hyphal elements, some cut longitudinally and some cut in cross-section, 
kind of sandwiched between these two types of stratum corneum. So this is an example of dermatophytosis. Now the organisms typically causing tenia or dermatophytosis are translucent. And as a result, they aren't as strongly basophilic. They tend to be more difficult to see than uh, the organisms call it, causing tenia versicolor. And a lot of times they'll be associated with a more brisk inflammatory infiltrate within the epidermis. We don't have a whole lot of inflammation here, but if, the, uh, if we have a geophilic organism or a zonophilic organism, zoophilic organism, then we're much more likely to see uh, inflammation. But again, look between these two types of stratum corneum, and that's where you're likely to see the high Well, what are, what are some of the clues that we have in a skin biopsy that, that would lead us to consider a possible diagnosis of dermatophytosis? Well, we've looked at one identified here, and that is notably the presence of the two-tone stratum corneum. Another clue is the presence of neutrophils within the stratum corneum or within the epidermis, the so-called newts and the worm. Anytime you see that, you want to make sure you carefully scrutinize the sections looking for a dermatophyte. Anytime you see a spongiotic dermatitis on a molar surface, uh, you always want to make sure that you look carefully for the presence of fungal elements in the stratum corneum. And the last and somewhat more subtle clue is also demonstrated in these sections. Anytime you see a psoriasis worm dermatitis with epidermal hyperplasia and an overlying compact cornified layer, a cornified layer thickened by compact orthokeratosis, that combination too can be a useful clue to dermatophytosis. So I wanted to make sure I pointed out some of the uh, some of the clues that should lead you to carefully scrutinize the quantified layer looking for um, fungal elements, or if you're reading your own slides, uh, ask the lab to, to do a PAS or a GMS. You want to make sure you have a pretty low threshold uh, for, for checking for fungus. Stains are easy and they're not that expensive and uh, can, can really help you with the diagnosis. Moving on to slide three, let me tilt the slide. We have a, a punch biopsy. As we move to higher power, we can see we're uh, likely on the head or neck. Uh, we've got a lot of terminal follicular units. Some of them are actually quite deep uh, terminal hair follicles. Uh, some of them are embedded in the subcutaneous tissue. And uh, so we're likely to be on scalp or bearded area of a male. Let me go ahead and clear that. As we move to slightly higher power, and I may have to reload this, I'm sorry because the slide's not letting me zoom in. But as we move to uh, higher power in this case, we begin to see a little bit of perifollicular inflammation. Uh, if we look at the epidermis, we can see it's mildly acanthotic, maybe with a little bit of spongiosis. But look at the hair shafts uh, the, or the hair follicles. The hair follicles are dilated. And take a look at the color of the hair shafts. These hair shafts are kind of pink, orange, or salmon in color. And I've found over the years that that can be a useful clue to a dermatophytic fungal infection. And if we zoom in here and look at the hair shafts, you can see that they're just loaded with arthrospores and hypoelements. This is a case of tinea cavitis, but you can see that same territorial change in hair shafts also in the setting of uh, Bianchi's granulum or just dermatophytic folliculitis off the scalp. Sometimes you'll get a lot of perifollicular inflammation. Uh, in dermatophytic folliculitis or tinea cavitis, sometimes you won't. Here we've got a, a kind of a mild, really perivascular infiltrative lymphocytes, but sometimes you'll get a pretty dense mixed cell lymphotrate uh, surrounding involved follicles, especially if they, they rupture. And if you get a suffered folliculitis with a perifollicular infiltrate containing neutrophils and eosinophils, I found that eosinophils in the setting of a separate folliculitis can also be a clue to uh, dermatophytosis. So this orange color of the hair shaft or salmon color of the hair shaft and 
uh, a mixed cell infiltrate uh, in the setting of a separate folliculitis with uh, neutrophils and eosinophils, think about the possibility of uh, dermatophytic folliculitis, or in this case, tinea capitis. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide four. Let me go ahead and flip it. Slide four, and we've had this uh, entity covered in uh, both in our board review and some other uh, some of our other of our sessions. Um, shade biopsy uh, from a volar surface. One can see right away a very very thick stratum corneum. The epidermis is of normal thickness, and uh, again the process here is is pretty posse inflammatory. And when we get a biopsy like this. So it's kind of our invisible dermatosis. Uh, that's when you want to start systematically in the stratum corneum and work your way down through the epidermis and dermis looking for subtle changes or subtle clues that might uh, lead you to the correct diagnosis. Well, if we zoom in here, as I'm sure you did, and look at the uh, stratum corneum here, lo and behold, uh, within the upper reaches of the stratum corneum, we see these uh, golden brown to darker color pigmented hyphal elements within the stratum corneum, which uh, produced a clinically pigmented lesion. This uh, biopsy was obtained to, to uh, rule out the possibility of an acromelanocytic lesion and specifically acromelanoma because it was a, a fairly large pigmented patch on the palm. And uh, the diagnosis in this case is tinea nigra. Sometimes tinea nigra will produce holes in the stratum corneum. And so on scan, if you see a posse inflammatory biopsy, a lot of holes in the stratum corneum, uh, it can be a clue to, to the diagnosis of tinea nigra. Typically does not produce a lot of inflammation. So it tends to be uh, much uh, less or much more posse inflammatory than some other dermatophyte infections. And of uh, course, the cause of organisms in, in uh, most uh, cases is Ordea wernickii, which tends to, to occur in hot, humid climates. So we see uh, a fair amount of um, tinea nigra in, in Texas and in the South. Uh, moving on to slide five. Slide five is another biopsy from April skin. One can see the epidermis is somewhat acanthotic. As we move to higher power, we can see again, this really is not too uh, heavy of an inflammatory process. There's very sparse infiltrative lymphocytes centered around a few dilated vessels. So again, we've got kind of one of these invisible dermatoses here. We want to kind of systematically proceed from the stratocornea on down, uh, looking for alterations. And as we begin to focus in on the cornified layer, we begin to see a few kind of depressions or pits uh, in the stratum corneum. And if we move to higher power, you know, you, you begin to see these basophilic to slightly gray structures uh, near the surface of the specimen. And at higher power, uh, we begin to see uh, kind of pretty small rods and cocci, some of them vertically oriented within the stratum corneum. Not much of an associated inflammatory response. And uh, this combination of findings uh, on, a, uh, on a volar surface, the pits and the presence of these uh, uh, cocci, bacilli, rods and cocci uh, within the stratum corneum is, is diagnostic really of uh, pitted keratolysis. You have similar appearing organisms in uh, uh, the setting of erythrasma, although in erythrasma, you frequently see more of an inflammatory response. And uh, of course, these are microcoxi or diphtheroides that uh, cause pitted keratolysis. Um, pitted keratolysis has such a distinctive clinical appearance and a distinctive odor that um, a lot of times so you, the diagnosis is made clinically in biopsies are done. But um, posse inflammatory pits in the cornified layer and these uh, rods and cocci on the surface of the specimen at the base of the pits uh, are uh, the uh, clues to, to the correct diagnosis of pitted keratolysis. 
Okay. And then the last kind of superficial mycosis or infectious process we'll look at is uh, illustrated in this particular biopsy specimen. This was from the pearl fold. And uh, one could see that the biopsy is mildly acanthotic. There's a superficial perivascular infiltrate within the dermis, uh, a little bit of thickening in the uh, stratum corneum that we can appreciate here. Let's go ahead and look at the dermal infiltrate. And within the dermis, uh, we can see a moderately dense infiltrate, largely of uh, lymphocytes, a few extravasated red blood cells here in the dermis. If we look over at the other edge of the biopsy specimen, kind of a little follicular hyperkeratosis. And if you focus in in this portion of the stratum corneum, we begin to see a collection of neutrophils. So we've got an early spongiform pustule here and some neutrophils present within the stratum corneum. And if we move into higher power, we begin to see these very kind of delicate but easily identifiable on H&E basophilic pseudohyphae, and uh, there are also a few spores. And uh, again, these have a similar color, easy to visualize like tinea versicolor, but they're vertically oriented, they're long, and they're associated almost always with a pretty brisk inflammatory response. Typically, you see neutrophils and scale crust. And this is uh, candidiasis. Again, see this uh, uh, pseudohyphae over here. You can see elongated, basophilic, vertically oriented, and usually associated with an infiltrate of neutrophils and sometimes some crusting in the stratum corneum. Candidiasis is always going to be mo more pro inflammatory uh, than tenia versicolor. And I find that a lot of people, when they're starting, uh, to look at skin biopsies and starting to study dermatopathology sometimes have a hard time distinguishing those two organisms. So again, they can look very similar tinctorially. Uh, the pseudohyphae in Canada tend to be a little bit longer, vertically oriented, and again, associated with an inflammatory infiltrate. So candidiasis. And that'll kind of close out our superficial uh, mycoses here. And uh, we'll go ahead and move on to to seven uh, and start to look at a few deeper uh, fungal infections. Uh, the next case was a punch biopsy. And uh, this was from the arm. And uh, as we move to higher power, we can see some sebaceous elements, notably present in this biopsy specimen. Hopefully, hopefully you noticed it, not that it had that much to do with the diagnosis. But there, there's a scar here. The broad zone of fibrosis, the void of that nexal structures in both uh, pieces, both halves of the biopsy specimen. But the most striking changes are the, are the presence kind of a, of a nodular infiltrate within the dermis, which you can begin to appreciate as you move to higher power. Now, clearly, there are some lymphoid cells, kind of these small dark cells at the uh, periphery of these nodular accumulations. But most of them are uh, composed of epithelioid histiocytes. And, and we obviously have a lot of giant cells here. I mean, look at the number of nuclei in this uh, histiocyte, just really uh, the cytoplasm forgot to divide. So we've got very, very large multinucleated giant cells. And then uh, as we look at some of these collections of epithelioid histiocytes, we begin to see a kind of hyalinization or caseation within uh, the center of some of these. And at higher power, we began to see several large spherules that are actually kind of very uniform uh, in size and shape. Uh, they have kind of a little bit of a refractile wall, and many of them had uh, within their cytoplasm kind of this, this gray, uh, foamy or granular cytoplasm, whereas others you could clearly uh, identify uh, spherules uh, with endospores 
in the, in their centers. And if we use our um, lymphocyte or, or an extravasator erythrocyte as kind of a ruler, they're about five to, to uh, six microns in diameter, we can see that these spherules are actually pretty large uh, in the range. Most of them tend to fall in the range of 10 to 80 microns. These are probably in the 40 to 60 range. And there are very few organisms uh, that are this large in this game. Really, when you see organisms this big, you really need to be thinking about coxie. Um, the only organism that can cause some confusion, uh, and it's a much more rare infection uh, with coxie, is rhinosporidiosis. And the uh, sporangia causing rhinosporidiosis are much, much larger than coxie. If coxie runs in the 40 to, to or 20 to 80 micron range, uh, rhinosporidiosis, the, the uh, organisms are, are typically 100 to 400 microns. So they're substantially bigger uh, than those seen in coxie. And again, it's a much more rare infection. Uh, and this, I, I want to stop here and uh, uh, just uh, point out that when you're, when you're um, preparing for your boards and when you're doing a study of uh, fungal infections, it's always a good idea to, to go back and look at photomicrographs of the organisms um, and familiarize yourself with uh, the morphologic features of the organisms. And size is critically important. And so you, you can always use, like I said, your, your red blood cell or uh, a lymphocyte as kind of a ruler. And find one of those in the tissue. Again, keep in mind that they're typically four to five microns or five to six microns in diameter, and they can be a ruler to help you gauge the size of the organism. Uh, the other thing is, um, a lot of times, uh, it's, it's the presence of pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus or suppurative and granulomatous inflammation that lead us to even consider the diagnosis of an infectious process or a deep fungal infection. And you want to hone in, usually the, the biopsies are fairly large, you want to hone in in key areas to increase your yield of uh, identifying an organism in each of these things section. And so some of the key places to look are in zones of necrosis, in the cytoplasm of multinucleated giant cells, uh, and in abscesses. Don't spend a lot of time looking in real well-defined granulomas because you're not likely to find the organisms there. That usually is an indication that the host is mounting a pretty good immune response. So again, know the morphology of the organisms, uh, size them up, use your, your internal rulers, the inflammatory cells, and spend your time if you, if, if you know you're looking for an infectious process. And on a test, you're gonna know that because the, all the answer choices are gonna be infectious organisms. Um, Make sure you look in in uh, foci of suppuration, uh, in foci of necrosis within uh, granulomas, and in the uh, cytoplasm of multinucleated giant cells. Those are going to be your high yield areas. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide eight. Slide eight is a uh, couple of uh, shade biopsies, uh, and one can see that the lesion that was biopsied was ulcerated. We've got epidermis and then a broad ulceration covered by purulent scale crust. And then within the dermis, we have kind of a nodular uh, infiltrate. Really, it's almost more dense, diffuse side to side, top to bottom. So we're going to need to, to see what cell types we have here. <clears throat> As we move to higher power, I think you can see even uh, at this magnification that we've got two cell types here. Okay, We've got a lot of lymphoid cells, and these cells have small, dark nuclei. They're kind of out here at the periphery. And then we have a uh, second population of cells, some of them forming nodular aggregates, uh, with a more epithelioid appearance. So these cells, I think you can see even at this power, have more abundant cytoplasm and nuclei that are slightly larger. And these, of course, are, are histiocytes, some of them forming granulomas. So we have a, a uh, somewhat of a granulomatous infiltrate here. And let's go ahead and look at the 
this piece here. And if we look at higher power in the foci where the histiocytes are, we begin to see a lot of really cleared out spaces. And as we move to higher power, we can see that these are histiocytes. And within the histiocytes, we have several small organisms. And the reason the cells are cleared out is that the organisms have, have, have uh, localized to the periphery of the cells. So they're kind of lining up at the periphery of these histiocytes. Most of the organisms uh, are quite small. And again, if we use our lymphocyte or an extravasated red blood cell here, and if we know that this red blood cell has a diameter of about five microns, Let's go ahead and circle that right here, then the organisms present within these histiocytes are in the two to three micron range. And what we have here, of course, is parasitized histiocytes. And when you see two to three uh, micron organisms within the cytoplasm of histiocytes in the skin biopsy, we've made this point in, in prior sessions, you're dealing with either histo or leishmaniasis. Now, there are a whole list of organisms, of course, that can give you parasitized histiocytes or histiocytes containing small organisms in their cytoplasm. But the only two that you're going to reliably and regularly see in H and E stained sections are histoplasmosis and leishmaniasis. And if the organisms uh, are located at the periphery of the cell, especially if it's occurring in concert with a moderately dense infiltrate of lymphocytes and uh, commonly plasma cells, and there are a fair number of plasma cells here in the infiltrate, the one is almost certainly dealing with, uh, with leishmaniasis. Um, both conditions give you parasitized histiocytes. Uh, the organisms are very similar in size, uh, but leishmaniasis shows one, a tendency to localize at the periphery of the histiocytes rather than filling their cytoplasm. And two, leishmaniasis tends to be associated with the heavier lymphoid or lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, whereas uh, histoplasmosis tends to be associated with more granulomatous infiltrate. So let's go ahead and look at slide nine, which was an example of histoplasmosis, so we can compare the two. This slide was scanned at uh, a higher power, so it looks quite a bit bigger. It was an incisional biopsy. One can see a little bit of epidermal hyperplasia. And then within the dermis, we see kind of a nodular accumulation of inflammatory cells, a few dilated vessels, a few extravasated erythrocytes, and there are lymphocytes within the infiltrate, to be sure. You know, if we move to higher power, we can see a fair number of cells with small, dark, staining nuclei and not much cytoplasm. But in most areas, the predominant cell type, <clears throat> excuse me, has a larger nucleus with a more evenly dispersed chromatin. And these cells also have fairly abundant uh, pink to slightly eosinophilic cytoplasm. And if we look in the cytoplasm of these histiocytes, uh, more in some areas than others, we can see that the cytoplasm is just filled with these small, very similar appearing uh, organisms, uh, usually one to two or two to three microns. Again, uh, I think you can appreciate it better, the size here than in the last case. We've got this five micron RBC. These organisms are, you know, one to two, maybe three microns in diameter, and they're filling the cytoplasm of the histiocytes rather than clustering at the periphery. Also, if we take a look at the uh, specimen, we can see that this is largely granulomatous and it doesn't have near the number of lymphocytes and plasma cells that leishmaniasis had. So both conditions, this is histoplasmosis. You could, you could verify the diagnosis, of course, with a GMS or PAS thing, in which case you can see the the uh, organisms within the cytoplasm. Some of them are surrounded by a slightly clear space. Uh, but the key differential here, again, is going to be between leishmaniasis and histoplasmosis. Both are located in the cytoplasm of histiocytes, 
both have a similar size. If they're clustered at the periphery and there's a dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, then glacializes. If the cytoplasm is filled with these organisms and it's more granulomatous with fewer lymphocytes and plasma cells, think histoplasmosis. And again, those are the only two of the organisms that cause parasitized osteocytes that you're going to see in uh, H&E stained sections with any regulated. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide 10. And slide 10 is a superficial shade biopsy. And as we move to higher power, we can see that this is uh, focally ulcerated. There's a uh, fair amount of purulent scale crust within the stratum corneum. The papillary dermis is pretty edematous. And as we move into higher power, we can readily see that there are these large clear spaces containing very pleomorphic yeast forms. Uh, and I say pleomorphic, the yeast forms are markedly variable in size and in shape. And they're located in these clear spaces, which are actually coalescent uh, capsules uh, of this particular yeast. Uh, the capsules would stain with Musi Carmen. The organisms would stain with GMS, and in this case, Montana as well, uh, even though they're not pigmented. And this, of course, is cryptococcosis. Um, Cryptococcosis can be gelatinous like this, or it can produce a more granulomatous tissue response. Uh, when it produces a more granulomatous tissue response, the capsule uh, tends to shrink. It's not as obvious, and so it can be much more difficult to recognize the organism in tissue sections in the granulomatous form than in the gelatinous form. Uh, the size of these uh, organisms uh, is. Uh, Typically, you know, seven, anywhere between one and seven microns, and um, a very characteristic appearance. Th this is a very social, or as Elston says, a very gregarious yeast, and it likes to live kind of in these yeast condos, not too good at social distancing. So when you see clear spaces containing pleomorphic yeast forms that are kind of clustered together, uh, think. Uh, about the diagnosis of cryptococcosis. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to slide 11. Slide 11 was a little bit of a tough biopsy. I Always is, this particular diagnosis. So we have a uh, shade biopsy, and um, right away one can see that there's fairly pronounced uh, epidermal hyperplasia. A lot of it's centered around follicular epithelium, almost pseudoepitheliomatous hyper here. Uh, there's an infiltrate of inflammatory cells around the dermis. We take a look at that uh, infiltrate. We can see if there are lymphocytes, plasma cells. In this case, there are a fair number of eosinophils as well. But if we take a look at the hyperplastic epidermis, we begin to see these neutrophilic abscesses within a hyperplastic epidermis. So this is kind of classic pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus. And of course, when we see that type of pattern, we always begin to think about um, infectious processes. And you know, some of the infections that com commonly produce pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus are chromomycosis, um, sporotrichosis can produce that pattern. And of course, sporotrichosis is very difficult, if not impossible to see in h and stain sections, uh, unless the patient's immunosuppressed. Uh, one can also see it in blastomycosis and rarely in uh, coxy. And in this particular instance, you know, you, you kind of hunt around and, you know, it's not real easy to see uh, organisms. But if you look in a few areas, notably uh, right in here, we began to see uh, a couple of very thick-walled yeast organisms that uh, are you know, roughly 10, 10 plus microns in uh, diameter. Uh, these yeast forms are typically thick-walled. Uh, they can vary in size between seven and uh, 15 microns. 
and uh, they'll stay with GMS uh, and PAS. And this is North American blastomycosis. What makes the diagnosis tough is that the, the organisms are usually very, very few in number. Uh, and you're likely to find them either in an abscess or in the cytoplasm of a giant cell. Um, I have to admit that, that most of the cases uh, that I've made, I, I, I haven't been able to find the organisms on H&E, and I've had to do the special stains. There also are commercially available immunohistochemical stains directed against the organism that can help with the, uh, with the diagnosis. But uh, anytime you see pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus, you know, you want to look for chromo. If you don't see chromo, have a, especially if the, if the patient's from an area where there is blasto, have a high index of suspicion for blasto. You're probably going to want to get special stains. I, it's not very frequently asked on boards because it's it's so hard to see uh, in tissue. But they could show you a photomicrograph and ask you to to identify it. And I think they'd likely give you a stain with that. Okay, let's go ahead and close out with slide 12. It'll kind of end our uh, discussion of uh, fungal things. And uh, we have a shade biopsy here, kind of a small piece of tissue. Uh, looking at the edge of the biopsy specimen, you can see a fair amount of uh, scale crust. The epidermis is a little bit hyperplastic. It's quite a bit of edema and a little bit of a nodular infiltrate in the dermis that's mixed. I think, you know, right away you can begin to see epithelioid histiocytes, some multinucleated, maybe a few lymphocytes. And then as we move into higher power, we begin to see these kind of blue, gray, uh, morula type structures. They almost look like berries and they're, they're uh, kind of septate. And uh, these uh, look somewhat like soccer balls. And um, this is a very characteristic uh, histologic appearance for prototheicosis. Prototheicosis is, of course, uh, an algae, and uh, it's an achlorophyllic algae, and it's found in tree slime. Uh, and prototheca usually, and prototheicosis usually occurs from implantation of the organism in an immunocompromised uh, individual. Uh, is a frequent cause of olecranon bursitis, actually. And uh, this is just a very characteristic appearance. What you want to look for are these five to 10 micron sporangia that have kind of a morula appearance with, with, with these septations that cause them to resemble soccer balls. And they're kind of this, this gray to slightly translucent color. And you'll, you'll frequently find them in, uh, in giant cells. So uh, prototheicosis. And this kind of closes out our discussion of things fungus, both superficial and deep. Again, I realized that we had covered some of these in prior sessions, but I think sometimes it's good to look at them all together. So, because it gives you the opportunity to discuss tissue reaction patterns and to look at the organisms uh, side by side. Well, I wanna thank you for your attention. Uh, I wanna wish everybody a very, very happy and safe uh, 4th of July. And uh, I'll look forward to um, being with you next week. Next week, we'll be discussing vascular tumors and it will be a live session. Thank you very much.